Another early one, boys and girls. Just think, in a week's time, it will be half past seven now instead of half past six. And uh, I'm going to have to basically get up an hour earlier every week to catch something like this. Which is, well, going to be a pain in the ass because I've just worked myself up to getting out of the house for six o'clock. And now I'm going to have to start to do it for the equivalent of five. I'm only joking. It's not going to be that much of an issue. I've really enjoyed this past couple of months actually. Coming out early in the morning. Walking these two poo machines when there's actually nobody around at all. And one of the best bits is obviously when I've walked across a couple of fields and through these woodlands. When we get onto the open heath. Then we get to see the wild deer. Well, semi-wild shall we say. So it's, it's, it really is worth it. And I've definitely noticed the seasons changing right before your eyes every day that you come out. Again, today is another cold one, but the past few days it's been really rather mild. And yesterday I managed to walk through the Ford again at Hardwick Village, which is a bonus. So the water level's dropping just a touch, or they're controlling it, they're regulating it. It's still a bit high, but I managed to get through with dry feet. Although today, I dropped some different boots on. We had a clear out in the porch yesterday and I found some walking boots that I've not worn. Well, probably once or twice, but I've not worn them for since I bought them. So I thought, well, I'll do, I'll wear those for walking instead of my Uvex, which I use for the brewery. And then I've got an old leaky pair of Uvex, which I can use for, you know, doing work in the yard and stuff like that. And the the good ones I use for, for brewery work because they're waterproof and chemical proof and the like. Anyway, I'm putting the phone down now, my hand's getting cold. All right, boys, now here's something for you. Just those little things that you catch. The sun's just coming up over them trees there, but it's well and truly over for those woods here and don't know if it's going to show up as well on the camera, but those trees are glowing orange. They look fantastic on that walk down, it was a real picture. So obviously the sun's striking the tops of the trees and whatever else before it's hitting the deck, although it is hitting the deck just in front of us. Just one of those things that make worth getting up at this time in the morning worth it we're just about down at the lake down at the lake and just here's another absolute absolutely beautiful thing that you wouldn't see normally it's just a pine tree growing away but look at this every single branch is covered in these spikes of ice and it looks absolutely breathtaking. It's gorgeous. It's all so symmetrical and clean. And anyway, the sun's up now, so this will be gone in a few moments. And probably nobody else will see that again. I mean, all of the trees and bushes and heather and grass... They've all got frost on them. It's still minus two degrees out here. It's been a particularly cold night for the end of March, but just look at that. I think it looks brilliant. And, you know, it would have been missed. It would have been missed were it not for Reggie's impulse to go for a walk before the sun goes up, comes up even. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? And I'll keep banging on about it, folks, but it's just one of them things. It really is the highlight of my day now. I'm glad I've tried to shoehorn this extra hour or two in every morning before we brew. So uh, that's what we'll be doing today. It's the Five Pints Bitter clone, or Five Points Best clone. It's not a clone, though, because I've changed the recipe, but... You know, it's more of an homage to the Five Points beer. And that's what's happening today. I don't know how much footage I'm going to get of it. 
but I'm going to try and capture a fair dinkum so we've got at least <clears throat> a 20 minute video of uh, not just me walking around Clumber Park <laughs> waffling about getting up early look at that good morning we'll get the dogs in shot there they are Oh well I tried to record these geese going mad when they saw me come round the corner but they've stopped now can you see the uh, the mist rising off the water I'd like to say I'm going to stop now but I just can't help myself it does look good Well, it'd be criminal not to get the ob obligatory Ford crossing on video, mainly because it's so cold. If I slip, <laughs> I'm going to be absolutely freezing. Oh, well, it doesn't feel too bad today. Yeah, it's not all that deep. It is overtopping the boots just a touch, and it will get a little bit deeper across here and a little bit slip here this is the deepest section just here we're doing all right so far this is where the bridge is out which I'm sure I've shown you before oh that's deep let's have a look yeah well, there's a runner up there on the bridge or on the levee well these boots that I bought have indeed worked. Oh, I slipped then. There appears to be no water ingress whatsoever. It's very slippy on these cobblestones. Oi! <laughs> you know, I do like doing that. That cheeky little walk through there. It is rather satisfying. I think the dogs like it too. Washes a lot of the mud off their paws that they've picked up on the way around. Right. I was going to say that's it. I promise no more videos, but I know what's going to happen. The sun's out and it's shining on Hardwick Village behind those trees. And when we get to the top of the hill, I just have to take a photo or video of it. Every time I come, I can't help myself. It looks fantastic. So maybe just one more thing. And then we'll be back in the brewery. That's a bigger hill than it looks. You see what I mean now? I mean, it is a bit misty today. So you can hardly see it. But on a good day. What a view. And today is a good day. But there's just a lot of moisture hanging in the air. So we'll maybe get a better shot of that later in the week. So I promise now we are going to brew some beer. As promised, we're in the brewery and we're about to start filling the mash tun with the grains. So, oh, it looks nice and clean in there, Jim. So, I'll just pass you to my glamorous assistant and uh, you can just follow me around, Jim, doing a bit of filming. So, we've got Maris Otter, 77.5 kilograms, or 77.75 kilograms, in fact. So this one's got the extra 2.75 kg in it, so it's a big bag. Hold on. Yeah. 
We've not done a brew with straight up Marisotta for a number of years actually. Unless it's been a small batch of brew. And then in here we've got 3.4 kilos of Vienna, uh, Munich, 3.4 kilos of wheat malt, and 3.4 kilos of crystal 150. So I didn't have any amber malt or melanoid in, so I've just used Munich and hopefully that'll give us the desired effect. And then when we come to ferment, instead of using the London Ale yeast that's recommended, we're going to use this old English from WHC Labs. This bad boy is available from Brookhouse Hops, cheaper than it is, direct from WHC Labs. So something worth bearing in mind if you want to mail order a brick. So let's get some water in, Gem. Let's open this up, purge the hose. Yeah, first, and then we're going to set for 220. Oh, I haven't got a valve on the bottom. Look, we need 220 liters. Now we're looking for a 68 degree mash temp on this beer, and uh, I've got my strike water set to 80. So, we might need to add a splash of cold. Just close that valve up there. And let's pump her in. Right, now we need a little bit of water chemistry. So, I'll just move my breakfast to one side. We're going to bring out the B400 Marsden Wayne Scale. Okay. And we're going to weigh out some calcium chloride and calcium sulfate. So we're just using the normal water treatment that we'd use for any of our bitters. And that is 177 grams of calcium sulfate. You'll notice this morning that I don't have a work shirt on. Because uh, I meant to change it after I bought the dogs. And I forgot, didn't I, Gem? I just put the dogs in. You did. And then I shot off again. Because so I was really keen to get to Morrison's for some crumpets. But having said that, when I got there, I saw that brown bread. And I thought, you know what? I might toast some brown bread today. And have some strong cheddar cheese with it. Anyway, that's a little digression. So 177 grams of calcium sulfate for our water. Yours will be different and 122 grams of calcium chloride. Every time I open this calcium chloride, it reminds me of swimming baths. We have to have a smell, Gem. You get the calcium, uh, the chloride, sorry, out of it. You can, it's not too strong. No, it's not too strong. It's a little bit like, well, it's the same ingredient that they have in uh, the window dehumidifiers. They're just full of calcium chloride at the bottom and because it's, um, what's the term now, a hydrophilic um, substance, it sucks the water out of the air, which is why it helps dehumidify your window sills. And then we want 260 grams or millilitres of ANS or AMS, depending on which proprietary brand you're using. Oh, I've gone a bit over there. Is it 260 or 3? I can't quite remember. 350. 350. There we go, then, so I'm not there yet. A little bit more. 360 will do. Let's round it up. And then, if you're using something like this, and it's always a good idea if you're working on the stainless steel surface to get rid of any dripped or splashes. I'll just pop that there for a second. Because the acid in this AMS or AMS corrodes. Come and have a look, Jen. It corrodes the stainless steel. So this surface is clean, but all these little dots here. You see all these polka dots? If you point it at the surface, darling, you'll get to see I'm them. I'm looking at the brown ones. Look, the so all these bits here, 
they're all splashes that people haven't wiped up when they've measured some out because it eats stainless steel and I figured that out purely by accident I had one of these auto pumps that you put on your 25 litres of uh, jerry cans of chemicals and they've got a stainless steel spring in them so I thought I'd apply the same thing to the ANS and the substance dissolved the spring so that spring went into solution right let's get this dry chemical calcium sulfide or sulfate calcium chloride in there then we'll wait till there's a little bit of solution to cover the grain before we add the acids so the acids will mix a little bit better and it's just a case of waiting for the mash to fill and we are we're 50 litres in so 10 litres for the next cell Put it there. Time for the sparge, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a good looking sparge, is that? So I've had a little bit of a panic on. Um, the spray ball, after I finished cleaning the tank, was a bit blocked up. So I've taken the spray ball off. Oh, I just nearly tripped myself up and died then. Taken the spray ball off, and there were some little bits of like white rubber stuck in there. Well, it turns out that. Um, our brewery hose has begun to delaminate inside. You can see there's a little hot particle stuck in there. Let's have a look at the other end, see what that looks like. Oh yes, you can quite clearly see that it's started to perish. So I've been online and it turns out that this brewer's suction and delivery hose isn't rated to 100 degrees but 95 so I've got in touch with a company called Flex Tech who we've used before and for about 160 quid I've ordered 10 meters of their brewers delivery hose and um, the T5701 which is rated to 120 degrees and that should be with us tomorrow or Wednesday so we'll get one more brew out of this bad boy I mean all the little bits of rubber that are coming off and whatnot they're all, here's a piece look, that I pulled off when I took the uh, hose clamp off. They're just pieces of the PTFE and they're odourless, flavourless and they'll settle out of, in the true I suppose, worst case scenario. But we've already started the beer. If I'd have spotted that last week then I would have postponed today's brew day. But seeing as we're mid-brew and this has probably been like that for the past 10 beers so one more is not going to hurt we're going to persevere but now I've discovered the issue we're going to change it immediately and put a brand new hose in so you'll get to see that this week as well the unpackaging of the new hose so to reduce the amount of pipe work that the liquid's got to go through we're only pumping into tank 4 today or tank 5 which is a little closer so we're able to cut off this length which means it's running through much less damaged pipework now the, the the natural sunlight interacts with the light from these LEDs at 50 Hertz and causes that flickering but if I have the natural light behind me it's not so much of a problem anyway a little digression so sparge transfer filling the kettle up We'll be weighing some hops out in a moment and then we'll be starting a boil but I am interested to see how this hose lasts for the last time today and uh, I'll be interested to see what gravities we pull out of this beer because that mash seemed like it was fairly thick for a four percenter so we'll see where we end up I have a funny feeling we're going to end up with a higher ABV or OG actually than what we're anticipating so we may have to do some liquoring back at the end of the boil so I thought I'd just grab a quick shot of the um, hose that we've ordered so this is the bad boy 5701 T5701 and uh, originally I wanted the suction and delivery hose 
uh, which is why I reinforced, much like our old one, which is down there. But unfortunately, they didn't do 13mm ID on the uh, steel wired one, only 22 therefore, or 19mm actually, 19 yeah. Therefore, I rethought the process and it turns out that they just do a delivery one down to half inch and they had it in stock which was excellent news. So I've placed the order and as you can see the temperature range is perfect for what we're doing. It's ADI free, it's CE rated or CE marked and uh, yeah it's got quite a burst pressure there at 46 bar working pressure of 16 we're never going to get to those limits but for anybody who's interested 10 meters of this I've got it about 15 quid a meter they don't publish their prices online for some reason but uh, I, which, which actually really pisses me off but uh, I think it'll be convenient for me to give you an idea. You may be able to get it cheaper elsewhere or negotiate a cheaper price if you're buying miles and miles of it. But for just 10 metres, I think 15 quid a metre ain't all that bad. So we're about ready to start boiling. I've got a little bit of anti-foam in here. So what I'm doing at the moment with the main tank is I'm recirculating the work out of the bottom cone back in through the Whirlpool port to emulsify, homogenise, you know, all of the liquid in there. I think that's the right word. So we don't have, at the bottom of the tank, loads of really thick, concentrated wort, and then at the top, loads of watery, thin stuff. So now it's pulled it out of that bottom chute there, into the pump, and out. We don't want to take out of this tank, I'm going to shout over the pump, we don't want to take out of this pipe from the tank during the brew otherwise it'll suck all the hops into the pump, yeah, into the pump filter. So we're going to close that valve and what's going to happen, it's going to draw through this smaller tank which takes off through our hop filter which as you can see is sat slightly higher on the tank so all the hops will sit down here close that listen and you can hear the change in tone so now it's pulling through this pipe so let's get this anti-foam then while it's mixing around and round that'll allow us to mix the anti-foam in you see so I'll just pop the lid now you can see she's spinning not much foam on there but there'll be even less in a moment there you can see it has an almost immediate effect of reducing any foam on the surface and that stops us getting any boil overs. Ah silence, the pump, the pump is off. So we've, Gemma's kindly weighed out the three editions of hops for us here. Oh my god very um, kind of earthy and peppery that uh, fuggles it's very nice so let's just have a look at these hop additions and what we've got going on for this five points clone so on the recipe provided by Johnny Garrett or via uh, dudes brews the hops required, I've got a loosely print out, loose, I've got it loosely printed out here, spit it out you. The hops required, there we go, excuse me, come to 37 IBUs or a bit in a gravity units ratio of 0 0.86. But if we look down on the hop additions podcast, <laughs> you'll notice that the 40 minute edition, sorry, 60 minute of 40 grams edition gives us 27 IBUs and the 15 minute edition gives us 10 IBUs and then at the flame out edition there is no IBU contribution from that 80 gram charge 
And now remember that 80 grams, that's twice the 60 minute edition, okay? That'll be important in a moment's time. So what I've decided to do is turn off any IBU contribution by the Whirlpool edition and we put the uh, the steep charge, the zero minute charge in at zero. Uh, for, but we're going to zero IBUs, but we're going to whirlpool it for 30 minutes. There will be um, an IBU contribution. Ignore what it says under that scribble there because these fuggles are 8.1% alpha, so it's probably double that. It's closer to 14 IBUs. Uh, so we're going to put 1,080 grams of fuggles into that addition, and we've got that from the fact that in order to hit 29 IBUs from our first charge we're going to have to put in 540 grams and of course we know on the recipe provided that the flame out addition was twice the amount of the bittering charge so that's what we've done and then we've got 8.2 IBUs from the 5 minute addition giving us a total of 27.2 IBUs and therefore a bitterness to gravity ratio of 0 0.86 which is what we were asked to do so that's how I've come around to getting this hop addition calculated now obviously the IBU contribution of this addition is going to be higher because we're not counting the IBUs given by the whirlpool addition or the flame out addition both of which whirlpool or flame out are going to contribute some IBUs now I'm going to do a whirlpool today, I like to do a whirlpool to help with clarity of the finished beer. So I'm going to do this whirlpool at 80 degrees C and by my reckoning it's going to contribute another 14 IBU. So this beer, saying it's coming out at 37, it's probably coming out at around 50 to be fair. Which in reality probably ties up with the bitterness that I tasted in the 5 points best when I did the review the other day. So let me know your thoughts on this. Do you think I've got this calculation right? Sorry, tool station delivery. So yeah, let me know what you think. Obviously we're working off the recipe provided which gives us zero IBU contributions on that flame out addition. I think I've worked this one out to the recipe and then after that we will make an amendment on ours going forwards and declare what we believe to be the true IBU contribution of that Whirlpool edition. So the bottle labels or the bar, whatever, the recipe itself, if I put this online, will include that Whirlpool IBU edition. But as of today, we're emulating somebody else's recipe to a degree. So that's what we're going to do. I'm just looking at my grain stock and I'm thinking, I'm going to have to put an order in soon. Or brew with lager malt. What could we do with that, boys and girls? Maybe a new recipe coming up? Why not? Let's have a bit of fun with it while we can. So we are now chilling down to 80. The hose is still doing its thing. We're getting a nice chill down there. And we're at 77.2, but that's because I've just switched hoses. So there's a bit of stratification going on there. So I'm just going to leave that for a minute more. And then we're going to add in our Whirlpool hops. In fact, I'll just set that to Whirlpool now. There we go. About that speed, I think. And we'll give that a moment for it to build up some momentum. And then we'll go in and we'll do the Whirlpool drop, which is the biggest of them all. And so it should be. I notice there's no dry hop on this particular beer, which is interesting. Okay, I'm, I think I'm probably happy with that. And we'll turn the pump off. And we'll take these beauties around. The obligatory moving hop shot. Don't trip up the stairs. There we are. Let's have a look what we've got. Not a lot of whirlpool movement, if I'm honest, but that's not the end of the world.
Lovely. Right, and then you may notice around the edges here, if I scoop, you can see that's some of the previous hot addition. So when the beer is cooled, I'm just going to swap hands here because I'm using the wrong one. When the beer is cooled, it shrinks away from the sides and any hops, any hops that are floating on the surface tend to stick to the edge and get left behind. So we want to incorporate them back in. They're not doing anything on the side, are they, I suppose? So I like to kind of, let me zoom out and show you this a little bit better. I like to swish the beer around the sides. So anything that's right down there at the back, I'm washing, washing that off as well. There we go. And that is good enough for me. Right then, lid back down. Move that up. That's a better perspective, isn't it? At the zoomed out lens. So we want to just pull this cover cap off and go for 25 minutes. The reason I've gone for 25 minutes is that alarm will turn off. <sighs> turn on, you prat. Just before I need to take the beer out and that gives me enough time to drain the acid out of this tank, which I'm about to pump in. That's the cleaning acid for tank five. So it's a two-handed job, ladies and gentlemen, said the uh, actress to the bishop. There's a new one. So I'm going to have to come back when we've got that. When we've got that in there. We're in. Now, can you tell the difference when I open this valve? You're listening. Listen to this tank. That's the spray ball giving her, giving her some wah. Transfer 90% done. Steamy, Tina Turner, steamy window style. So let me see if I can prop up the camera somewhere. How's that? That's not bad. It's not great either. Ha <laughs> ha! It's tricky. That's not great. Uh, that'll do. That'll do. So let's get the yeasty boys in here. So first things first. We've got a funnel. And we've got our English uh, old English yeast. And there we go. Straight in. Next, we're going to shoot in our Bruce Clarity. That's in. We're going to pull that in here on the acid. And then finally, we've got the pink tilt. And we'll program this in a moment or two. There we go. We've got everything in the tank. We're going to put the top of the T fitting on. And then just down here, we have CO2 injection on a timer to give a 10 second burst of CO2 every two hours. But we don't need that to happen until we cold crash. So we're going to keep the valve on that closed. Just give it a little dip in some acid. And that is now 90. 9% safe until fermentation starts. And then of course once fermentation starts, this whole tank will be outgassing through this port and there'll be no ingress of oxygen whatsoever. 
until Cold Crash comes, but to counteract that, obviously, we'll open our valve and then we'll constantly keep a little bit of CO2 on the beer. So until then, this little fella is happy and started. One thing we do need to do is take a gravity reading and see where we are on our numbers. So what we're going to get is what we're going to get. I didn't actually lick her back. I forgot all about it. So I've had a few other things today. So I've got a funny feeling we might end up with a higher than 4.1% bitter which will be fine but we're shooting for 10433 so we're looking for final gravity of 10433 or starting gravity so let's just have a look what we are on and I thought we were going to balls this one up to be fair so this is obviously a huge Stevenson Reeve hydrometer which we use for brewing and they are accepted by HMRC and we're at 1042.9, oh, 1043 on the nose I would say I'd say that's 1043 smack bang on the line that's not bad is it? So, if I just get myself in the mirror, I've got a jug full of uh, the wort, the sweet wort here. Let's just have a sample. Mm, it smells very bitter-esque. It tastes fantastic actually. So, mm. It's going to be a bitter bitter, I can tell, but I'm really pleased with that final gravity. I keep saying final gravity because it's the end of the brew day with that specific gravity, 10.43, it should have been 10.433, that's for calling a big ship and we're going to record 10.430, I'm really pleased with that, hopefully it ferments out nicely and we can manage to get on our final gravity numbers as well. There hasn't been any hitches with the brew day. We did manage to get a full, uh, the mash temperature up to, you know, 68 degrees C, which is what we wanted. And everything apart from the hose has gone smoothly. So we may have to use that hose one more time tomorrow. So it's hooked up on a rig so I can clean. I've got a, a new hose for the spray ball. So we'll get a good, good clean in the boil kettle and then I've just rigged, jerry-rigged the old hose up. So at least tonight it goes through a sanitation process. That'll happen automatically overnight. And then in the morning, if the new hose arrives in time, we'll obviously hook it up. If it doesn't, this'll get another run out of the bag. And then hopefully Wednesday, the new one should be here. But all in all, what a cracking day. The time is five... Dyslexic, numerical dyslexia, 4.56 and oh, well say I was up at five o'clock I'm feeling pretty good I think I'm gonna go home edit this vlog get it on the tubes and design a beer for tomorrow I fancy doing something different not something just out of the bag I might have a little play with those new hops that we bought the other week shall we have a look at them before we go I said around here let me just Jump on the grain sacks. So we've got Simcoe, Idaho 7, Talus. What was that other one in the middle there? Is that more? I thought I bought something different. What's this bad boy? Oh my goodness. I should have thought this through, shouldn't I? Uh, what does that say? Amarillo. Ooh. I haven't done an Amarillo beer straight for a long time and I've got a ton of Amarillo leaf hops that I could bag and put in. I think I'm going to do that. We're going to have an Amarillo IPA. Freaking right so we'll see you on the next one boys and girls. It's new recipes galore! A little bit of bonus footage addendum boys and girls. 
Alan Birch, aka Alan Westcombe, I believe, the guy who bought some American Jester off me for his wedding. I found your beers on the back of a shelf. I apologise profusely, but this one has stood up to a little bit of ageing, my friend. It is freaking awesome. Not really something that I'd go in for. An oak aged espresso imperial stout at 9.5%. But this one is going to keep me awake all night. Cheers.